That was the ending to the 2001 Tim Burton film, Planet of the Apes. A remake of the classic science fiction film of the same name from 1968, which itself was based on a French novel by Pierre Boulle, published in 1963. And if you're wondering what the hell just happened, well, so was everyone else. This movie had filmed several different endings because of Planet of the Apes' long history of twist endings, and this was the one they went with, and believe it or not, it's actually a lot more similar to the ending of the original book. But the thing is, it was confusing, absurd, and above all else, disappointing. The ending wasn't the only thing Burton's Planet of the Apes was scolded for, because despite having some incredible production design and cinematography along with possibly the best practical makeup ever used in film, the story was seen mostly as nothing more than an overly simplified race allegory that just didn't have enough heart or soul to match up to its predecessors. I mean, Tim Roth seemed to be having fun growling at everybody though, so good for him I guess? But to act like Burton's Planet of the Apes was the start of the franchise's downfall just wouldn't be true. The classic movies from the 60s and 70s, while certainly having their charm, haven't aged particularly well despite the original's great popularity upon its release. And as the films went on, it became apparent what they really were. The classic Planet of the Apes sequels were made out of the desperation of 20th Century Fox, who had suffered some major losses on some big budget films. As such, not only were the films made only out of financial necessity, but as they continued, their budgets lowered further and further, with the box office numbers steadily decreasing before the entire franchise was relegated to a couple of television series that proved vastly unpopular both only receiving a single season due to exceptionally poor ratings. And save for some spare comics, the franchise lay dormant until the 80s when Fox began trying to revive the series only for the project to end up in development hell as directors and actors came and went on the project until finally, Tim Burton became attracted to the idea of reimagining the original film in the late 90s. What followed was a long, arduous production with a budget of $100 million going on to make $362 million worldwide, but its performance paled in comparison to that of its competition. The newly begun Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings film franchise is absolutely trouncing the apes at the box office with comparable budgets. Combining that with a lukewarm to negative reception from critics and fans alike, Fox chose not to move forward with plans of a sequel despite saying they would make one if the film were a financial success. And Tim Burton would go on to say when asked if he had interest in returning to the franchise, I'd rather jump out a window. All of this culminated in one conclusion. Plan of the Apes was, for all intents and purposes, dead. Fox shelved the franchise, and fans of the series were simply left to accept that it was doomed to be a relic of its time, one that maybe should have stayed that way from the beginning. Perhaps it was just always destined to be nothing more than a recognizable name without much of a future. But then, something amazing happened. I had collected a variety of material for different ideas for scripts. Everything from genetic research. I'd been following that several chimps had attacked their owners. You know, there's been a lot of that in the news in the last number of years. And then I'd done some research on that and found that there's a huge number of people in the United States that are raising all kinds of primates. But I just kept staring at this thing. There's got to be a, a good idea for a story here somewhere. And the truth of the idea just popped. Oh my God, I think this is Planet of the Apes. Rise of the Planet of the Apes changed everything. It was a box office success, a critical success, a story born from the minds of a couple of screenwriters who loved this series and had an idea to revitalize it. And the crazy thing is, it worked. What would follow was a trilogy of films that pushed the boundaries of franchise filmmaking, three movies that would break the mold of what studio blockbusters could do, what they could say, what they could be. Films that were the home to landmark special effects, incredible performances, spectacular writing, and emotionally complex characters. Films that tackled themes of oppression, identity, and conflict. Films that asked the fundamental question of what it meant to be human. What followed was a trilogy of films that I consider to be the perfect trilogy. And if I'm going to explain why, this film is where we need to start. I need to explain what made this movie a triumph. I need to explain how this movie took a decades-old franchise and not only revived it, but improved and expanded on it. And to start talking about all of that, I need to start at the beginning. Let's make one thing very clear at the outset. We owe the existence of this trilogy to two people primarily, Rick Jaffa and Amanda Silver. This is their movie first and foremost. 
They came up with it, they pitched it, they wrote it. This wasn't Fox hiring them to write a plan to the Apes movie, this was a couple of screenwriters who had a story to tell. This movie and the trilogy that would follow started with them. And they had quite the difficult task here with Rise. Rise had to do two things, reignite interest and reinvent the franchise. This had to be something new, something different from what we had gotten with Planet of the Apes before. If they wanted this to work as a new beginning for the franchise, it had to take the franchise and do something new. So what did they do? They did something very, very simple. Start from the beginning. Now, I hear you diehard Planet of the Apes fans out there saying, this isn't the first time Planet of the Apes showed us how it all started, and you're right. Both Escape from the Planet of the Apes as well as Conquest of the Planet of the Apes both showed us the very early beginnings of the Planet of the Apes world, but they also began with time-traveling apes and apes doing slave labor, respectively. Not even to mention that they were still continuations of past films. What difference does that make? All of it. All of the difference. One of the hallmarks of previous apes films was starting the film with the unfamiliar, a planet where apes were the dominant species, a group of time-traveling apes. Strange and unexplained happenings, these films were all about making you question what was going on and why. What Rise did was different. Rise started with only three things. An ape, a lab, and a dash of hubris. Simple and familiar. What this does is create an entry point without prerequisite. A decades-long franchise that now has an acceptable starting point. You don't need to hunt down all those movies and shows, you can just start here. No esoteric nonsense about time travel. This world is our world. These apes are our apes. These struggles are our struggles. It's apes being tested on in a lab, a son trying to hold on to what little of his father is left due to disease. It's familiar. Viewers don't have to worry about what they don't know because the plot of this film is founded on what they do. Draw the audience in with the promise of apes, but build to it from the familiar. The audience doesn't have to make any logical leaps because they're seeing it all grow naturally from the roots of what they already know. It's so simple it's borderline genius. And then, once it has you in its grasp, it doesn't let up. The pacing in this screenplay is incredible for that. There's a wonderful sense of narrative flow unparalleled in the rest of the franchise, in spite of the fact that this was probably the busiest film in the series on a plot level. The movie has to set up Caesar, the ALZ-112 and 113, the character of Will and his father who has Alzheimer's, the rise of the apes themselves. By starting it from the beginning, you create a different problem. You now have to set up an entire franchise in one movie. But the narrative flow of the screenplay stops the film from feeling un balanced or shoddy. For every action, there is a reaction. Every moment leads into the next. Will gets baby Caesar, he sees what's happening to him because of the ALZ-112, he decides to use it on his own father as he's getting worse and when the disease comes back stronger than before because of it, that leads to Caesar needing to protect him which causes him to be taken away, do you see what I'm talking about? Rather than it feeling like we're moving between several different plots, it feels like we're just moving to the next link in the chain of events. And moving that chain along are people characters who make decisions that lead the story into each successive moment. The thing here is that most of these characters take cues from the original film. They're simple and meant more to represent distinct ideas rather than intimate, real people. The villains of this movie are great examples of this. Steven Jacobs and Dodge Landon. Neither of these characters are hard to figure out, and that's pretty much the point of them. Jacobs is just a figure of corporate greed whose only motivation is making money. Landon is representative of abusive authoritarians who rule through fear. His main purpose is to hurt the apes and the apes have to obey him out of fear for getting the hose. They both represent different types of real villainy, but they're ultimately very simple characters meant to service a different one. In fact, every character is in service to one other one. You see, I maybe kind of lied before when I said this movie started with the screenplay, because it didn't. It started with a character. If you know anything about Rise, you know that it's about Caesar. The first ape to get smart, the leader of the ape revolution, the main character of this entire trilogy, Andy Serkis's motion capture magnum opus, Caesar. And this was where Rise began. Development of the script began with Jaffa and Silver's conception of the ape leader himself because they knew this was the most important character. We knew that we could get the audience to root for the apes because they would be rooting for Caesar and they loved Caesar and they were in with Caesar. And what a surprise that was. If you look at all the different trailers for the film, you'd be forgiven for believing that Rise would actually be the movie of James Franco's character, Will Rodman, the scientist who created the ALZ-112 that made Caesar smart in the first place. 
After all, it wasn't exactly uncommon for the apes films to put humans at the forefront, but that's not what happened here. This movie is about Caesar because this movie is about the rise of the apes. It would have been easy to make this movie about the reaction of humans to the rise of the apes, but Jaffa Silver and director Rupert Wyatt knew that the real heart of this story wasn't in the how of the apes rising, it was in the why. And that why resided within the personal journey of Caesar himself. Because while every other character here is a simple representation of greater ideas, Caesar is a fully fleshed out, emotionally complex person. Caesar's story is one of self-discovery and finding home, about coming to understand what he is, where he belongs, and what that means. And that starts with his relationship with Will Rodman. Will was basically a father to Caesar. He raised him after his mother was killed trying to protect him. He took him home, fed him, played with him. He was, for all intents and purposes, Caesar's father. And this is where things start to get interesting. Because as Caesar grows up with Will and his father, he comes to believe something important. He believes that he's human. He has little reason to think otherwise, especially when Will tells him explicitly that he's not a pet. But if he's not a pet and he's not human, what is he? What is Caesar? As Caesar grows older, it becomes harder for him to ignore that he's different. He's on a leash like a dog, he's covered in hair, he can't speak with words the same way most other humans can. He's different. He knows that he is. But he doesn't know what that means or if it should mean anything. There's this wonderful moment where Caesar looks into a mirror, hand hovering over his birthmark, and though he says nothing, not even with sign, you can tell every emotion going through his head. The confusion, the shame, the denial. That birthmark is a symbol of where he came from, what he is, the identity that he can never escape no matter how much he hates it. Caesar doesn't want to be an ape. And that's more important than anything else. Caesar is ashamed of what he is and wants nothing more than to just pretend that he isn't, and Will doesn't exactly help with this, completely embracing the idea that he's Caesar's father, even going so far as to tell him that is the case. And in that, there's a bond of trust between Caesar and Will that exists within any good father-son relationship. There's a trust that says, I trust that you have my best interest at heart. And it's here that we begin to see the motif of the supplicating gesture. The supplicating gesture is seen throughout the film in various forms as it reflects the ever-changing dynamics of authority and trust between the characters, primarily between Will and Caesar. It's incredibly important to track this progression, so I will be noting most of the times it comes up, including this first instance here in the Redwoods early on in the film. This establishes Will and Caesar's relationship quite handily. Caesar respects Will as a figure of authority, he isn't free to explore the Redwoods unless he gains Will's approval. He believes that Will has his best interest in mind, and by submitting to Will's authority, he gives Will the opportunity to say no. By growing up with Will and his father, Caesar has grown to identify with and care about them. He's grown to trust them implicitly, even if their decision was one he wouldn't like. A decision like going into the ape sanctuary. Caesar sought to protect Will's father, a man whose Alzheimer's was getting worse and worse, who barely even knew where he was when he crashed his neighbor's car. Caesar was just protecting his own, but in doing so, he's forced to recognize they're not his own. He nearly bites this guy's finger off, he beats him to a pulp, and the world doesn't see a human protecting his friend, they see a wild animal going rabid. They're afraid of him, and he's ashamed of that. Ashamed of what his own protective instincts caused him to do. It's hard to internalize that sense of inherent human worth when the world looks at you like you're not human. It's hard to internalize that when you know you aren't human. When Caesar is taken to the ape sanctuary, he's scared and confused, treated like the animal he doesn't want to believe that he is, but when Will shows up, he takes his hand. A form of that supplicating gesture that says, I trust you. He believes that Will has his best interest in mind. He believes that Will won't treat him like the animal everyone else does. With Will, he can be allowed to feel human. In fact, this, uh, this place seems kind of fun. There are toys in here, there's a big tree I can climb. This might not be so bad, but wait, this is a wall. That's not real, that's a wall. Wait, they're closing the door, they're locking me in. Wait, I'm still in here. Wait, 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 wait! And once again, 
Caesar is confused and afraid. The people he trusted, the hand that he took, leaving him behind with people who will treat him like an animal, force him to live among his own kind. And that's probably the best place to take a break from Caesar's story, because we need to talk about those other apes. Or rather, we need to talk about what brought them and Caesar himself to life. The visual effects, and more specifically the motion capture of this film, was done by Weta Digital. They haven't been around for that long, being formed as recently as 1993 to work on the Peter Jackson movie Heavenly Creatures, but since then they've gone on to become one of the leaders of the industry in digital effects and motion capture technology. They worked on a few films you might have heard of, The Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, Three Out of the Four Avengers movies, Ad Astra, Prometheus, Avatar, and of course, the all-time classic, Alvin and the Chipmunks, The Road Chip. So, you know quite the track record. The point is that Weta is well known for some of the most impressive, groundbreaking, and ahead of their time special effects in the industry, and what they're probably best known for is their incredible work with motion capture. They created Gollum, they created King Kong, they created motherfucking Theodore, <laughs> Sorry. Pizza toots. and what do all of those characters have in common besides Weta? They were all played by the man, the myth, the legend. Andy Circus. Okay, it didn't actually play Theodore, but could you just imagine it for a second? Sorry, pizza toots. Here's a hot take, or at least a mildly tepid one. Andy Circus is one of the most underutilized character actors in the game. The fact that I can count the number of his leading roles on one hand is absolutely criminal as far as I'm concerned. But luckily for us, Caesar might just be Circus's peak. The amount of emotion and character here is more than many actors could ever hope to achieve outside of motion capture, but every ounce of Circus's performance, the confusion, the fear, the anger of Caesar is all there on this digital ape. And that is because Circus understands something about motion capture that few other performers seem to. The basic usage of performance capture is to, to create a fidelity to the actor's performance. So when you see it on the screen, you will see the apes, but they're apes which are infused with the heart and soul of an actor's performance. Motion capture doesn't create a performance. Those facial expressions, that body language, that shame, fear, confusion, melancholy, and anger, that's all Andy Circus. That's all the actor behind the motion capture. That isn't Weta, it's a person. And that's why this all works so well. Because while the physical body of Caesar is ultimately a digital creation, the emotions, struggles, and conflicts of the character are entirely human. And this begins a motif within the entire Apes trilogy, that of digital effects built on the foundation of practical ones. Everything in Rise that's done by a computer is founded in real, built sets by production designer Claude Paré. The Robin House? That's three separately built sets. The Redwoods? Not actually the Redwoods, but still a real forest. The Golden Gate Bridge scene? Not on the actual bridge for obvious reasons, but it was still shot outside with practical effects all around them. And alongside the grounded production design, we have the unsung hero of the entire trilogy, Terry Notary, who not only plays Rocket in all three movies, but also is the certified movement coach for all of the ape actors. He taught every ape actor, including Andy Serkis, how to move and emote the way that a real ape would. So, on top of real sets and on-location shoots, the apes feel as real as possible in their digital husks. All of this lends itself to a general sense of tangibility and reality. There's no reason for you to believe that any of this isn't real. Even though, deep down, you know that's not actually an ape, you know that's not actually a gorilla attacking a helicopter, you know these things aren't true, you're allowed to believe that they are. Because even if they're not real, they're still interacting with real sets, real props, and real people. Digital effects can't tell the story. They have to be auxiliary to the narrative, not its entire foundation. That foundation in Rise is made up instead of wonderful character actors, limited but well-constructed sets, and the realistic movement of apes that make for some of the most true-to-life motion capture of the time, only to be surpassed by its own successors. And I haven't even mentioned how detailed these motion capture models are. Rendered down to every last hair, building them from the skeleton to the muscle to the skin, focusing even on the way their breath would fog up a window. And speaking of windows,
Caesar has been brought to this place, this supposed sanctuary, with other apes who are everything he's ashamed of about himself. He's forced to confront everything he can't escape about what he is. He tries to make this a good home, he tries to make friends with the other apes, but they aren't human enough for his thinking and he isn't ape enough for theirs. It just feels like he doesn't belong. And when he reminisces about the home he used to have, the time when he believed himself to be happy, he takes comfort in the window of his attic bedroom. This window is the most important symbol in the film. There's a sort of duality to it. It's a view outside, a means of looking out into the world, seeing what's just beyond your reach, but it also acts as a barrier. It may let Caesar look outside, it's his best connection to the outside, but it's also the very thing that keeps him away from it. And each time he tries to go beyond that window to help others or satiate his own curiosity, he's punished for it. He goes out to fix a kid's bicycle and he's chased off with a bat, injuring his leg. He goes out to help Charles and he's taken to the ape sanctuary. He sees these things from the attic window, but the moment he tries to move past it, get involved, he's punished forever trying. And when he, at least to the humans, goes too far, validates what everyone believes will happen if he goes past that window, that window is taken away in exchange for a cold, stone cell wall. And what does Caesar draw on that wall in an effort to comfort himself but the very window that used to act as a barrier? Because it was something. It was more than this. It was better than a cage without a window. Despite that window separating him from the outside world, he longs for it now because he at least had that. And now he has nothing. And this is where we begin to understand what Rise of the Planet of the Apes is really about. The psychology of oppression. The apes in these movies have never been a specific allegory for anything. They've always just been apes since the very beginning. What Planet of the Apes has always been is a crazy concept, apes becoming the dominant species on Earth, and using that to explore and critique broader concepts about our society, war, religion, race. By looking at these ideas through the lens of apes, we're allowed to come to terms with these institutions. We're allowed to view them as they are, as they've always been. We're allowed to see that humanity is no better, no more superior than any other part of nature. Apes, humans, doesn't matter, because we're all animals. We are no better than apes, apes are no better than us. And Rise takes this concept, the idea of deconstructing human arrogance through apes, and hyper-focuses on one effect of that arrogance. Oppression. You give people only so much. A window, perhaps. Something that isn't enough that's more of a barrier than a bridge, and you tell them that it's enough. How you make them believe that it's more than they deserve. And then, when they rightfully try to take more, when they try to take what is theirs by natural right, something as basic as identity, or freedom, or home, you take away the window. You take away what little you gave them. You put them in a cage without a window. And the oppressed will long for what little they had before, what little they were given. They'll regret ever asking for more, ever demanding more, because now they don't even have what little they were given before. After all, the best method for oppression is to make the oppressed believe they are the ones at fault. That they are the problem for wanting more, not the powers that be for refusing them. And that's what we see here with Caesar. A character who asked for more, who tried to gain more, and who was stripped of the only things he had the window he had been given, now longing for it as he's forced to come to terms with what he perceives as the truth. He's an ape. He's always been an ape. And apes don't matter. He should have been grateful for the window. And this framework could be applied to so many things, so many real life examples. Examples I'm unfortunately just not qualified to cover in any detailed capacity, and because I'm underqualified for that, I have to focus on the example I am qualified to cover, or at least most qualified. And while it may not be as important as some of those other real life examples, it's important all the same, and gets to the core of why Rise of the Planet of the Apes 
is an absolute triumph. Question. Have you ever heard of Edgar Wright's Ant-Man? Of course you haven't, because it doesn't exist. Edgar Wright worked on the project for a while and seemed to really believe in it, but he parted ways with Marvel over creative differences. We instead got Peyton Reed's Ant-Man and, well, I'm not even sure that's true. Chances are good that the movie we got was Marvel's Ant-Man. And don't get me wrong, I love the MCU, but this wasn't the first or last time Marvel would take complete control over a project in the stead of individual storytellers. And they weren't the first or last company to do this. I think this quote from Edgar Wright about his departure sums it all up pretty well. I wanted to make a Marvel movie, but I don't think they really wanted to make an Edgar Wright movie. And who suffers here but the storyteller. The director who had a story to tell who wasn't allowed to tell it because it didn't comply with what the studio wanted. And Marvel still gets to make their movie, they make millions of dollars off it, and Edgar Wright's Ant-Man's story goes entirely untold. And once again, Wright's not the only victim to this. Countless stories either never happen or are heavily altered because the studio put more emphasis on what would get the most butts into seats, what would appeal to the largest possible demographic. Countless stories gone untold due to that dreaded curse of creative differences. A director is given a franchise or an entry in a franchise, or perhaps they approach a studio with an idea. For a new entry. They may be excited for the new opportunity. Hell, this might even be their big break, but when they start trying to tell their story, they're forced to work within limitations. They have to make the movie the studio wants or a close approximation. The studio doesn't want an individual story. They want something that makes money because that's what a studio is meant to do, after all. But it's at the cost of a creative vision. Either the storyteller makes the movie with those limitations, or they don't get to make the movie at all. A storyteller, a writer, a director, the thing they know how to do better than anything else is to write their book, make their movie, tell their story. And if they try to take their right to tell the story they want to tell when under the umbrella of a studio's influence, too often will they not even get to tell a story at all. If the window isn't good enough, they won't even get that. It sends the message that if you aren't willing to tell the story we want you to tell, you won't get to tell a story. If you don't submit to the authority of the studio, you get put into a cage without a window. Unable to do the very thing you know to do best. Unable to be what you are. While this isn't the entire industry, and again isn't nearly as important as some of the other ways this framework can be applied, it still fits. It's far too commonplace for big studio franchises that began as individual passion projects to slowly succumb to the mass appeal of focus groups and box office numbers. Why tell a genuine, real, heartfelt, and intimate story when you can maximize your numbers so much more by making a movie built on the statistics of profit, pushing away any storyteller who isn't willing to comply? But Rise of the Planet of the Apes did something crazy. It did something that not a lot of other franchise films are allowed to do. It looked at all of that, took it all in, recognized the window as the barrier it is, and it said, No! That no means everything. But to understand why, we need to understand how we got there. There's this scene after Caesar has been in the ape sanctuary for a while. This scene after Caesar has tried and failed to make this world the same as his old after he's been beaten down by his own kind and his oppressors, after he's been told no so many times and in so many ways. Will returns to the sanctuary and for the first time in a long time, Caesar is happy. Not just because he gets to see Will again, but because there's a possibility, however slim, that he'll get to leave with him. He may get to go home. He can have his window back and he won't take it for granted ever again. He grabs Will's hand, once again putting his total trust in the man who he sees as a father who will always do what's best for him, who will always have his best interests at heart. And when Will tries to take Caesar out when he realizes he's been abused, he's reminded that he can't without a court order. Caesar asks if he's going home and Will tells him that he's not. At first, there is a glimmer of that same confusion we've seen several times before, but it's instantly replaced by frustration and anger. This isn't confusion anymore. This isn't fear. This is Caesar looking at the one person he knows he can trust turn his back on him. 
Caesar gave his trust to Will, let him be the authority, and now he's being told that this is for the best. That being in this cage without even his window is in his best interest. And this is the moment where Caesar breaks. He takes the shirt he wore into the sanctuary, a symbol of domestication, and he uses it to wipe away that window on his cell wall, that one emblem of home that he had now gone by his own hand. It's this moment where Caesar says, this window is not enough. The person I trusted more than anyone else, the one I believed knew what was best for me, left me behind. And if the world won't give me back my window, I'll take it myself. And I'll take more. The more that I've deserved but have always been denied. It's this moment where Caesar realizes that things are stacked against him that they always have been. It's not an even playing field. No part of the system is working to help him only against him. And so he realizes that he has to take action himself to build a better world for him and his kind. Caesar begins to think and plan. Plot. He starts to use his mind, the thing that sets him apart from the rest of the apes who, while intelligent in their own right, just aren't as capable of critical thinking. He forms relationships with some of the other apes, mostly a circus orangutan named Maurice, who also knows sign language and is probably on the most similar level of intelligence to Caesar. And it's through this relationship with Maurice that he begins to understand that he shouldn't be ashamed of being an ape because they can be just as smart as him. They can be just as kind, they can be trusted. Perhaps the only ones who can truly be on his side now are the ones who have been through the same things he has. Told no countless times, abused and toyed with, treated like inferiors, used only for other people's amusement and service, oppressed for the benefit of the oppressor. Will won't ever understand that the same way that Maurice or Rocket or Buck will. And these relationships are founded on the exact opposite principles of their abusers and oppressors. While Landon and Jacobs lead through fear and greed, Caesar leads by empathy and mercy. He frees Buck the gorilla from his cage. He showcases his strength to Rocket, but also his capacity for mercy. He teaches Rocket to give cookies to the other apes, showing them kindness to create bonds of trust between them, rather than hosing them down in an effort to create respect through fear. Caesar creates a group that trusts and cares for each other but knows who leads them, a group based on trust, kindness, and togetherness. Apes together strong. And the greatest gift that Caesar gives them is the ALZ-112, the thing that made Caesar what he was, the thing that gave him the capacity to do all of this because his oppressors got cocky and never thought about the possibility of an ape like Caesar rising up. Caesar chooses not to retain his advantage among the apes, but to share that intelligence with them. This group can get nowhere if they aren't allowed the same opportunities, and Caesar knows that. While Caesar remains the leader for his growing strength of will and empathetic leadership, the other apes will not be oppressed because they weren't given the opportunity to know better. And once Caesar's plans are already in motion, Will returns once more. He's lost his father to Alzheimer's now, and he doesn't want to have to lose Caesar too. He goes under the table and bribes the man who runs the sanctuary so that he can get Caesar back. And when Will comes to the cage that he allowed Caesar to be put into, when Will holds that leash in one hand, holds out the other, effectively saying it's time to go home, Caesar shuts the door in his face. That outstretched hand, another form of the supplicating gesture says everything we need to know. It's not Caesar that needs Will anymore. It's now Will that needs Caesar. And Caesar rejects him because he sees the leash in his other hand. He knows that if he goes with Will now, lets his home be there with him, he'll just go back to that same window, that same limited freedom he'll never be able to break free from. While Will is submitting to Caesar now, he knows it's only a matter of time before Will begins again to treat him like the animal the rest of the world sees him as. Because it was never about Caesar to Will. It was never about Caesar's well-being. He took Caesar in because he couldn't handle the idea of euthanizing him. He kept him around because the way his medicine affected him needed to be recorded. And when he became emotionally dependent on him, he only decided to work outside the system for his own benefit. Because while Will is not a bad person, while he isn't the villain, the fact is he never saw a Caesar. He saw an ape. And apes don't matter. And Caesar knows that now about Will. 
and he knows how wrong that is and rejecting him is a hard thing to do you have to remember that will is still caesar's father and, and when he closes that door on him he has to turn away unable to face the man who raised him but after will leaves the apes begin essentially to cheer for caesar because his identity doesn't lie in the leash of his father but in the freedom he promises to his own kind rise of the planet of the apes is about freedom in many ways but i think it's mostly about our freedom to embrace what we are choose who we want to be and to let go let go of who and what we were told we were supposed to be let go of the identity that was thrust onto us of the one we wanted to have Caesar doesn't have to be leashed to the idea that he's somehow inferior to human beings or that he doesn't deserve to be free. Caesar's identity is more than just the adoptive son of Will or the unplanned result of genetic inheritance. Caesar is a leader and a revolutionary. Caesar is kind, empathetic, strong, curious, and intelligent. Caesar matters. Who he is matters because apes matter. Caesar has the freedom to embrace that. To let go of the idea that he doesn't matter or that apes don't matter. Caesar chooses not to be ashamed of what he is and he chooses to be the leader the apes need him to be. To find his home with apes and to never be ashamed of that home. And then finally, this all culminates in that fateful moment. Caesar defies Landon and stays outside his cage when all the apes are supposed to go back. When Landon comes out, threatening punishment at the lack of obedience, Caesar continues to defy him. He spoke a word which had been spoken to him all time without number by humans. He said, No! Silence. That no hangs in the air as everyone around is allowed to absorb it and its implications. Caesar just spoke. An ape just spoke. That one thing that's supposed to be relegated only to human beings the capacity for spoken language and an ape just did that and his first word was no and in that no is every emotion caesar has not been able to express up to this point all the anger all the fear all the confusion the melancholy despair and desperation all pushed out in that one booming word no that no is the ultimate defiance, not only against Dodge's order, not only against the oppression of his kind, but against the very foundation of what apes are expected to be able to do. Even the other apes are afraid, but only for a moment because that no wasn't just for Caesar. It was for all of them. That no said, enough is enough. We won't be treated like this anymore. We won't be denied the freedom we deserve. We won't exist only for your purposes, we will be oppressed no longer. And that brings us to the triumph of Rise. That title, that mouthful of a title, Rise of the Planet of the Apes. It is what this movie is. It's rising up from abuse, uncertainty, fear, oppression. This movie is about rising up against the systems that put people down and keep them there, that make it nigh on impossible to move up, to be free. It's about rising up against forced, shameful notions of identity and home. It's about rising up against the idea that a window is or has ever been good enough. It's a film about never letting the world tell you what you're meant to be. Never letting them shame you for who you are and fighting hand in hand with the people like you. It's about an ape born into privilege being brought down to the level of the rest of his kind and realizing that he has a responsibility to bring them back up with him. And this movie was made based on these philosophies, saying no to the ones in power, to the conventions laid out of what you're supposed to be and instead doing what you were always meant to. This film wasn't a studio mandated blockbuster built on the back of box office statistics, it was a passion project written by fans of the franchise who had a character with a story to tell. It was a director who loved the idea and wanted to bring it to life, 
It was the cast and crew who loved this series and were eager to tell the next chapter in the saga. One of the main reasons Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes failed was because it was a studio mandated blockbuster where every member of the cast and crew was shadowed by budget concerns and rushed production schedules, rewrites of the script happening while sets were already being built. Nobody really had a story they were being allowed to tell and what had started as an earnest attempt to revive the franchise became nothing more than a studio's desperation to just make an apes movie. And any vision that Tim Burton or anyone else had was throttled and pushed to the side as a result. But Rise was all about the vision of the artists. Rick Jaffa, Amanda Silva, Rupert Wyatt, Andy Serkis, they had a story to tell, a message to bring, and they sought out the means to create it. An intimate, passionate, emotionally charged film about identity, oppression, and freedom. A story about rising up against those who would dare limit you to a window. The climax of this movie is pure catharsis because it's seeing a group of beings who have been abused and mistreated in one way or another for the entire runtime finally showing the world what they can do and what they really deserve. What they're willing to give for the things they deserve by right. And at the end, Caesar and his apes have crossed the Golden Gate Bridge and made it to the Redwoods where they can finally be free. Will follows them in, and before he can be hurt by one of the other apes, Caesar comes in and puts out a hand. Not as a supplicating gesture. He's not submitting to Will's authority here. This is a gesture of equality. A hand to help him up and bring him to equal standing with Caesar. And Will tries to tell Caesar that this isn't worth it. He tries to tell Caesar that his home isn't here but with him. But Caesar says three words. He's with his people. He's free. They're all free. He's home. No longer is he stuck in two worlds. No longer does he feel like an outsider to both. No longer does he feel lost or alone or afraid. He's embracing what he is. Caesar's an ape, and that's okay. It's always been okay. And Will accepts it, because with those words, Caesar proves to him that he's so much more than Will ever thought him to be. The triumph of Rise is that it went against every expectation, every notion of what a movie like this is supposed to be. Like it or not, Hollywood is full of sequels and reboots, movies meant to be nothing more than franchise potential, but Rise went against all of that. It's rife with special effects, but those effects are grounded by real sets and actors. It was a reboot of a decades-old franchise built from the passion of a couple of screenwriters who had a story to tell, not just a studio that wanted to make money. And through that passion, built the foundation for a trilogy driven by the vision of artists and storytellers who wanted to share stories of emotionality, family, and humanity, even when telling the stories of apes. It shows us that what's important isn't to please other people, but to fully embrace our identity and understand that home is where you're allowed to be you without anyone pushing you down or forcing you to think that you're less and never turning around and doing that to anyone else. And it's why, after all is said and done, when Caesar finally begins to climb that redwood tree, when he stands looking over the world, it feels triumphant. What I thought was exciting about this idea, which was that you would be going a step further toward an ape civilization, was taking that character who was sort of a revolutionary and watch as he became a leader. And a leader really uh, of, of a, a group of apes that were all part of a family. So that you could see all the different aspects of Caesar that made you emotional in the first film and that would ho hopefully only take you deeper and deeper into that in Dawn and see what he was like as a father, see what he's like as a leader, see how he will lead in difficult times. It's one thing to be a revolutionary, it's another thing to have sort of a, a, a difficult moral dilemma that you have to grapple with. 